Well, I will do my best to explain what uh, Wittgenstein meant by invoking the concept of games to explain how uh, language has meaning and what the meaning of that is for a broader conception of the philosophical enterprise. Um, but I also want to say something a bit about uh, Wittgenstein's games in a slightly different sense. Um, I shall, uh, towards the end, talk about why it is that uh, Wittgenstein had his interest in the question of, of language and the importance of understanding language for philosophy, uh, because there was a, a second motivation that lay behind the work that he did. Now, Wittgenstein is very much a, a philosopher's philosopher in the sense that to understand him, in order to make sense of the enterprise on which he embarked, and I should actually use the plural there and say the enterprises, because there is a, quite a dramatic difference between his first and his second attempts to um, explain how it is that language has meaning and what the implication of that is for philosophy. But to explain that, one has to put him in context. And the context, indeed, is provided by the work that another great Cambridge figure did in the early part of the 20th century, and that is the work done by Bertrand Russell. Now, Russell, um, uh, as you know, was very ambitious indeed to try to show that you could place mathematics on a logical foundation. And uh, his great work, The Principia Mathematica, which uh, cost him uh, and A. N. Whitehead each 50 pounds to have published. I mean, this is a pretty egregious example of vanity publishing, if you uh, uh, consider it. And 50 pounds, after all, back in the Palmer year of 1910 was quite a large sum of money. And he and Whitehead had to take the manuscript of that magnificent book uh, to, the, um, to the press in a perambulator. Uh, so heavy was it. Uh, and but Russell himself pointed out that only three people had ever read beyond Proposition 56 in the Principia Mathematica. That was himself and Whitehead and a madman in Texas. <laughs> so th th this, this uh, huge endeavor of, of Russell's, um, and which turned out, alas, uh, to be a proof of the failure of the attempt, at any rate so far, uh, to carry out what was known as the logicist project, that is to show how you could base mathematics on, on logic. And one of the outstanding reasons why that's so, of course, was the work done by Kurt Gödel in the 1930s. But in the process of doing that work, a great deal of very important philosophy came out. This was a wonderful example of what the French poet Paul Valéry once said, which is that a difficulty is a light, but an insurmountable difficulty can be the very sun in what it reveals to us of matters of importance. And this was certainly the case um, uh, with that great endeavor, because in the course of it, Russell identified a number of approaches, uh, came up with a number of ideas, which have proved of the very first importance in philosophy ever since. I open a footnote here and just remark that uh, those of you who are engaged in one or another way in philosophy might occasionally ask yourself the question, why is it that outside philosophical logic and the philosophy of language, Russell is not so much mentioned any longer? And I think a large part of the reason is that Russell is in fact the wallpaper of uh, recent analytic philosophy. There is so much of what he did and um, that uh, we now no longer bother to quote or, or cite him on it. All you need do is to look through the index of his book, The Principles of Mathematics, which published in 1903, uh, set out in, in more schematic form what he and Whitehead tried to carry out in the Principia Mathematica, uh, to see there listed all the major topics in analytic philosophy. And so he really is a very seminal figure indeed in an almost literal sense of that term. Now, the important thing that uh, came out of Russell's work for Wittgenstein's own work was that Russell came to the conclusion that we needed to find a way of explaining how it is that um, we can connect what we say to what we are talking about, to effect a connection between language and the world, which respected some very basic common sense intuitions about what the world is like. Early on, uh, Russell had been persuaded by a view taken by the Austrian philosopher Alexius Meinong that words mean, have meaning, by denoting things. That fundamentally, the uh, semantic relation is a relation of denotation. Uh, so if I use the word lepton, then uh, that word 
the meaning of that word is the object that it uh, can be used to refer to. That is an object of this kind here that I'm standing in front of. Uh, if I say the word watch, uh, meaning um, it as a noun, then it has its meaning an object of this kind. It denotes uh, a, a timepiece. And one consequence of this was that since there are many words in the language that don't denote spatiotemporal objects, physical objects in the world, that nevertheless they must, by virtue of the fact that they are meaningful, like for example the word unicorn or the, or the name Harry Potter, that these uh, expressions must denote something. And if they are not actually existing entities in the world, then the things denoted must in some sense, as Meinong put it, subsist. That is, they must have some kind of, of uh, metaphysical being so that they can be the denotata of the words that we use to refer to them by. And um, Russell accepted this view until he realized, in fact, it was pointed out to him by yet another great Cambridge luminary, G.E. Moore, um, that uh, this was had a very uncomfortable result, which is that merely by talking about your infinite number of siblings, you thereby bring them into subsistence. And this makes for a very overcrowded universe. Indeed, W.V. Quine later described it as an ontological slum. There are far too many entities to be referred to in this simple way. And Russell said, well, this came to offend my vivid sense of reality. There can't be lots of subsistent entities, subsistent unicorns, because we talk about unicorns. And for this reason, he gave up not the idea that the meaning of a word is the object it denotes, but he gave up the idea that uh, most words, in fact, almost all words except two, are actually denoting expressions. And the two words that are alone denoting expressions are the demonstrative pronouns this and that. Because every time you use them, there is guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be something that they denote. Of course, we should admit they're plurals as well, so I suppose there are four denoting expressions, this and that, these and those. So by, by turning all apparently denoting expressions, nouns and names, into non-denoting expressions, Russell had to come up with a, an explanation of how this works. And he did it by saying that these apparently denoting expressions are actually concealed descriptions. They're descriptive phrases. And this allowed you to uh, overcome the great difficulty of uh, having an account of meaning based on denotation uh, uh, without the ontological slum attached to that way of thinking about things if you stuck with minor. Indeed, there was another motivation that Russell had, and that is that Russell, of course, wanted to preserve what is called bivalence. That is the idea that uh, our language is uh, one in which um, there are the, the two alternatives that we have uh, in connection with things that we say or assert about the world is that they are either true or false. That there are just two truth values, truth and falsity. And if something isn't true, it's false. And if it isn't uh, false, then it's true. Now, this is quite a, a claim. Um, you will be aware of the fact that there are other possibilities for a proposition's not being true. It might fail to be true because, for example, it's meaningless, or it might fail to be true because there may be more than two truth values. Indeed, now um, we have uh, multivalent logics with even an infinity of truth values possible in them. And so the, um, the, the genuine opposition is not between true and false, but between true and not true. But Russell was very anxious to uh, preserve bivalence because he wanted the logic that he was using to explain language to be a classical two-valued logic. And the reason why he wanted that in turn was that in order to show that many of the nouns and names in our language other than this and that are in fact concealed descriptions, you have to provide an analysis of the surface forms of language into what underlies them logically. So for example, Supposing you were presented with the following puzzle. Supposing somebody claimed that the present king of France is wise. Now, unless you think that uh, Monsieur Hollande is actually the present king of France, then you're inclined to think that there isn't one. You're therefore inclined to think that it's not true that the present king of France is wise. But not because there is an unwise present king of France, but because there isn't a king of France. And so what Russell had to do was to, to dig down into the underlying structure of the sentence, uh, the present king of France is wise, to show why it's false. 
for a reason other than the wisdom or unwisdom of anybody who fits that description. So he did it by saying this, if you look at the structure, the logical structure of the sentence, and if you represent that structure in purely logical terms, get rid of the English words that make up the sentence, and so just look at the form of the thought, the proposition which is being expressed in this sentence, then you notice that what you're doing is this. You are saying, there is uh, something at the moment. Let's call it X. There is an X which has the property of being present King of France. And for anything whatever which is present King of France, that thing is identical to X. Now that little bit of logical machinery takes care of the word the in English, because the seems to imply uniqueness. And so in order to capture the idea that there is one and only one thing being talked about, you have to say, if anything has that property, then it is the same thing as X. And whatever has that property, has the further property of being wise. So there is an X, such as X is King of France, and for anything whatever Y, if Y is King of France, then it is the same thing as X, and X is wise. And now this gives you two ways of showing why the whole proposition is false. Either if there is a present King of France, that he is not wise, or if there is no King of France at present. And this overcomes the problem. You're all familiar with this problem, perhaps when you're asked a question, and there is a presupposition lying behind the question which is not fulfilled. The classic example is someone says to someone else, have you stopped beating your wife? And uh, of course, if you've never done so, you can't say no, uh, because that means you're still doing it. And you can't say yes, because it means that you once did it. So you have to say, well, hang on a second. You, the, the, there's an assumption lying behind what you say, which is that I once did it or that I do do it. Uh, and that assumption is not fulfilled. And so I can't answer your question. That seems to be a way to deal with that difficulty. Russell's way of doing it was to say, if you look at the underlying logic of the assertion in question, then you see that there are two different ways in which the surface proposition can be false. Now, I've had to explain this, and this, by the way, is known as the theory of descriptions, described by yet another uh, Cambridge luminary, Frank Ramsey, as a paradigm of philosophy, as a perfect example of a piece of conceptual analysis. And it is a rather beautiful piece of, of philosophy. Um, this I've had to explain because it is what, when Wittgenstein came to Cambridge and worked for five terms with uh, Russell, uh, sparked off the work that resulted in his, the only um, bit of philosophy that he published in his lifetime, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which I know you were all reading in the bath last night in preparation for this, so uh, it would be uh, quick and easy to explain what he was attempting there. Now, Wittgenstein, of course, uh, as uh, some of you may know, been brought up in an extremely wealthy and influential family in Vienna. His father was a, a, an industrialist and a very wealthy man, a, a um, donor to the secession in uh, Vienna. Uh, and um, he had tried to educate his children at home very unsuccessfully, so unsuccessfully indeed that Ludwig himself, when he finally was sent to school, couldn't get into uh, a, a decent school at all, and in fact had to be sent off to uh, uh, Linz to get into uh, what the sort of equivalent of a, what used to be called a secondary modern, uh, where he was a, a, an, Im an immediate contemporary of uh, Adolf Schickelgruber, later known as Hitler, Although, um, in fact, I don't think they knew one another because they were, although the same age, in different classes. And then, uh, um, because he couldn't get into a university since he didn't have sufficient qualification, uh, Wittgenstein was sent to a technical college in Berlin, berlin Charlottenburg, where he became interested in aeronautics. He became interested in aeronautics because he had originally had a great desire to study physics with Boltzmann in Vienna, and he had heard that Boltzmann said that the new science of aeronautics required heroes and geniuses. I mean, people who were both heroes and geniuses at the same time. This is because in those early um, days of heavier than air flight, uh, you needed to be heroic enough to accept breaking your neck on a fairly regular basis, and genius in order to understand the principles of aerodynamics. And Wittgenstein very much wanted to be a hero and a genius. And so he got interested in aeronautics and um, as a result went off to uh, study at Manchester University and it was while designing a propeller at, Man at Manchester that he became interested in the mathematical properties of uh, propellers. This led him on to an interest in mathematics itself 
and he thought that he had, and this is rather characteristic of Wittgenstein, solved the problem of the basis of mathematics, wrote an essay which he sent to Gottlob Frege in Jena University, and Frege very kindly invited him to come and talk and explained to him that his paper was complete rubbish and he needed to go and study with somebody who knew something about the um, philosophy of mathematics. And he, Frege, recommended Russell. And so Wittgenstein came to Cambridge uh, in 1912 and he spent five terms dazzling Russell with his powerful and eccentric personality. Russell reports that Wittgenstein used to knock on his door at two o'clock in the morning and storm into his rooms and Russell would say to him, are you thinking about logic or your soul? And Wittgenstein would say, both. Uh, anyway, he tremendously impressed Russell. He also impressed G.E. Moore, by the way, who said that he thought Wittgenstein was a genius because he was the only person who frowned during Moore's lectures. This is a tip, by the way, for anybody who wants to. <laughs> but while working with, with Russell, who had uh, just at that point, of course, finished work on the Principia and um, explained to, to Wittgenstein much of what he uh, had been attempting and thinking, talking also about the move that he was then making into more recognizable uh, areas of philosophy, and in particular epistemology, the theory of knowledge, because he was at that time busy writing a book, um, which he abandoned actually, as a result of some criticisms that Wittgenstein offered him on the book. But he sparked off this desire in Wittgenstein to provide a solution to the problem um, of language and how language has meaning and what the logic of language is. And when the war broke out, Wittgenstein went to join the Austrian army. He was a mechanic for a couple of years uh, on the Eastern Front in an artillery unit. Then he trained, uh, did officer training and went to fight on the Italian front, where with the um, surrendering Austrian forces at the end of the war, he was imprisoned for a while near Monte Cassino. And at that time, he had in his backpack the manuscript of the book that came to be called the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, a name for the book, by the way, that uh, G.E. Moore came up with uh, in imitation of uh, one of Spinoza's works. And this book, in a very, very pared down, highly economical, uh, very austere way, um, set out a view about how it is that language and world can connect and thereby how language can have meaning. And just to put it in the crudest of terms, the proposal that Wittgenstein offered was this. Both the world and language obviously are complex things, and complexes have structure. And if you look at the structure of a complex, if you analyze those structures down to their elements, to the atoms, as it were, the things that are no further analyzable, the logical symbols at the bottom of the structure, you can see how the two structures parallel one another, even if you can't specify what the different levels of structure are. So he said, here on the one hand you have the world, and here on the other hand you have language. And there are facts in the world, the world consists of facts, and little footnote, not of things, because if you gave just a straightforward inventory of the things there are in the world, like my left shoe and my right shoe and this lectern and this building, you wouldn't just be describing how the world is. But if you say there is my left shoe and my left foot and my left shoe is on my left foot, then you've described a fact, a way things are in the world. So the world is the totality of facts of how things are arranged and not arranged, but not just of a mere inventory of things. So you have the world, and it consists of these facts. And you have language, and language is made up of propositions. And by proposition, Wittgenstein meant what in the early phase of analytic philosophy was meant, namely the expression of a thought, the expression of a claim about the world. A proposition is not to be identified with the sentence. The sentences, uh, it's raining, il pleut, es regnet, xia yu, they all mean the same thing in different languages. They all mean it's raining. They're expressing the proposition that it's raining. And so it is the proposition which, um, in its physical embodiment as, a, as an assertion or a sentence in a given language, uh, relates in some way to facts. Now the quick question is, how do they thus relate? Well, you see this there, Wittgenstein, if you look at the further levels of structure. Facts are made up of what he called uh, states of affairs. And states of affairs are made up of objects. 
Now, he said, I don't know what states of affairs are. Now, I don't know what objects are. I don't know what you would actually empirically or find out um, constitute these lower levels of structure. But any complex must have structure, and any complex must eventually end in the simplest level of structure. So let us just denominate them as follows. The world is made up of facts. Facts are collections of states of affairs, and states of affairs are collections of objects. And parallel to this is the structure of language. Language consists of propositions. Propositions are made up out of elementary propositions, and elementary propositions are made up of names. Now, I don't mean names like Tom, Dick, and Harry, uh, said Wittgenstein, I just mean whatever the most basic units of language are. So I'm just talking about the formal structure, not the actual content. And here you see how the structures parallel one another. Propositions describe uh, um, facts, uh, actual or possible facts. Uh, elementary propositions describe states of affairs, and names denote objects. And it is, it is at this very lowest level of structure of language that the connection between language and world is effected, because the arrangement of names in an elementary proposition will be a picture of the arrangement of objects that constitute a state of affairs. And he meant the idea of the picturing relation quite literally, because it captures the sense of the way that uh, different formal structures can uh, actually be representations, representations, or depictions of one another. He gives us an example, the, uh, a musical score, the movement of the pianist's fingers on the keyboard, the airwaves propagating to the eardrums of listeners, the music as heard. Now, each of these different phases and stages have an internal connection. From the uh, musical score, you can uh, deduce something about what will be heard and vice versa. Uh, somebody who has the skill could listen to a piece of music and transcribe it onto staves. And this is because of the logical relationship in which these different um, uh, instantiations of the music share a pictorial representation of other phases of the music. So as it were, the musical score is a picture of the sounds heard. The sounds heard can be treated as a picture of the musical score. And this, therefore, is the nature of the relation that uh, matches the arrangement of names and elementary propositions to the arrangement of objects. The names picture the objects. They denote them, so the denotative theory of meaning is preserved, but the explanation given of how it is that propositions up at the top of the structure can be pictures of actual or possible uh, facts resides in that relationship at the very bottommost level of the two structures. And this, in essence, is what the Tractatus argues about how language has meaning. But there is a very, very significant other aspect to the Tractatus, which Wittgenstein himself described by saying that the most important thesis uh, offered by the Tractatus is that half of the book which could not be written. And this is a point, it sounds rather Vedic, and mysterious, and indeed, there is something rather vague and mysterious about it, and that is the bit, that is the game Wittgenstein is playing, which I want to come back to uh, a little bit later. So there we have the idea of, um, uh, of, of the Tractatus, the central theme of it, and uh, Wittgenstein, again, rather characteristically, you may remember that the essay he sent to Frege was uh, an attempt to solve the problem of the logical basis of mathematics, and he now claimed that the Tractatus had solved all the problems of philosophy. And he claimed this because, he said, um, if uh, a proposition is a, a picture of an actual or a possible fact, uh, then that is how it has meaning. And if it isn't uh, a picture of an actual or possible fact, then it is meaningless. It is empty. It is nonsense in the literal sense of that term. But the only um, possible uh, and actual facts there are in the world are the ones that can be described by science. So the only meaningful discourse is science, or common sense anyway, which uh, relates to science in that science gives a more detailed and circumstantial account of our common sense beliefs. But all the things that we want to say in ethics, in aesthetics, and religion, since 
the propositions or seeming propositions that we assert in connection with those subject matters are not pictures of actual or possible facts. They are, in the literal sense, nonsensical. Not, however, that that means that they are in some way unimportant. And this, therefore, is the second unwritten half of the Tractatus. All the things that are most important cannot be said because the propositions in which you attempt to say them are not pictures of actual or possible facts. So that's the point that I want to come back to later. So he thought he'd solved all the problems of philosophy. If you understand how language works, you see that, um, that you can say things of a scientific and common sense nature, but you cannot say anything about uh, ethics and aesthetics or anything really important. Uh, and therefore, that uh, solves the whole problem. People can stop doing philosophy now, shut up shop, and go home. And this is, in effect, what he did. He, he uh, trained as a teacher. Um, like Russell himself, and like Karl Popper, a number of the major figures in philosophy in the interwar period, who, shocked by the First World War uh, and its effect on um, what had seemed to them to be advanced uh, civilized countries, they came to believe that the only way to prevent another tragedy of that kind occurring was through education, through the education of the young. And they all, in their different ways, became educators as a result. As you know, Russell opened a school uh, at Telegraph House, which was a house owned by his brother, then Earl Russell. Um, and there's a famous anecdote told about it, that uh, a bishop once visited the school, knocked on the door, it was opened by a naked child, and the bishop said, my God. And the child said, there isn't one. So this was meant to be <laughs> characteristic of, of uh, the kind of school that you would expect uh, Russell to run. Wittgenstein himself, however, had a very unsuccessful uh, period as a teacher. He, he taught for uh, um, several years indeed, about four years in all, uh, at different schools in the Austrian um, hinterland, uh, and uh, eventually had to abandon his school teaching career because he got into trouble having struck a child who fainted or, or collapsed unconscious, and the parents were very angry and wanted to institute an inquiry against Wittgenstein and his teaching methods, uh, which are reminiscent of my own that I had as a, as a youth when the cane was very liberally employed, um, hence the, uh, the rather good memory I have. And he um, <laughs> therefore became a gardener in Vienna, wanted for a time to be a monk, um, wasn't at all engaged at that point with philosophical reflection, until he was invited by members of the Vienna Circle and Moritz Schlick and the others, uh, who were interested in what he had to say in the Tractatus because they thought, I think mistakenly, indeed I think the consensus would be that they were mistaken, in thinking that their view, the so-called logical positivist view, which said that only empirically uh, verifiable sentences had meaning and the things that we say in ethics and religion and so on don't because you couldn't verify claims made using that kind of language. They thought that the Tractatus was uh, very much uh, in, in their way of thinking and they invited Wittgenstein to come and discuss with them. Uh, he didn't accept the invitation, although he did discuss privately with Schlick and one or two others of the circle, but, but not officially as part of the circle. But bit by bit they persuaded him that he hadn't actually solved all the problems of philosophy. They made him see that there might be some difficulties with the Tractatus. And so in the year 1929, he returned to Cambridge and he submitted the Tractatus for the degree of PhD. He was supervised by Frank Ramsey, then only 24 or 25 years of age. Tragically, uh, Ramsey died the following year uh, under an anaesthetic at Guy's Hospital in London, uh, having been ill for a while. A very, very brilliant, brilliant young man indeed. And he acted as um, Wittgenstein's supervisor. And the Tractatus was examined by Russell and Moore. Moore was um, very, very opposed to the PhD, which he regarded as a frightful import from Germany via the United States of America and didn't at all like it. And so his report on the Tractatus read as follows. This is a work of genius, but it otherwise satisfies the requirements for the PhD. <laughs> so, so Wittgenstein was awarded the PhD, and, and then he was helped by, by Russell to get a five-year research fellowship at Trinity College. And while there, he began to write copiously. And indeed, over the, the, uh, the next uh, um, two decades, really, um, these notes that he made uh, presented themselves to the philosophical world in 
sent his that form. Uh, some of the students that he had wrote down uh, things that he said in his seminars. He dictated to some of his students. And little by little, some of his ideas came out. Um, but it really wasn't an after he died that uh, these works were published. And the most uh, significant, um, in fact, I suppose in, for Wittgenstein scholars, they are all very significant, but for the wider philosophical community, I suppose the one that was most significant, an outcome of the work that he did during the course of these two decades, was what we now know as the philosophical investigations. And it is in the philosophical investigations that we meet with the concept of games that uh, proved to be very central to this new and very different phase of Wittgenstein's thought. And it was a phase predicated on the idea that he had been quite badly wrong in the Tractatus about how language has meaning. And indeed he says in the exordium to the Philosophical Investigations that really you ought to read the Tractatus alongside the Investigations in order to see how wrong the Tractatus was uh, and why, therefore, it is necessary to revise the view um, uh, about the nature of language and how it works. One major continuity between the early and the late philosophy of Wittgenstein is that Wittgenstein, uh, at the time that he was writing the notes that were eventually published as the philosophical investigations, continued to believe that philosophy is not a real pursuit, that philosophical problems are actually spurious problems, that they arise because we misunderstand the way language works. He'd taken that view in the Tractatus, he still held that view. But he now had a dramatically different way of thinking about how language works. Not by uh, having a relationship to something other than itself, namely the world, by these connections of denotation or reference, but instead that meaning arises from the uses that we make of language in the very, very many different ways that language is used. He now saw, for example, that the Tractatus had given us an extremely impoverished view of language, as if language was only ever used to say things like, this is a table, and this is a watch, and there is a glass on the table, it's raining outside. That is, as if language was just a collection of assertions, a collection of propositions. He now recognized that there are many, many different things that we do with language. We ask questions, we give commands, we make statements, we um, express our desires and wishes, we play act, uh, we quote poetry. Uh, there are many, many different things that we do. We make demands on others. Um, we uh, perform certain actions like saying, I do thee wed, and the like. And in these, this great variety of uh, um, areas of language and the differences between them are what create philosophical difficulties when we make the mistake of assimilating uses in one area of language to uses in another, where we mistake the way that an expression works in a given area of language. And he called these different areas of language language games. Now, he didn't mean by the word game here something frivolous or unimportant. He meant that just in just the way that a game is an activity which has its own rules, which explains how you use uh, the, the, the pieces in the game. Think, for example, of chess or backgammon. Um, it's a kind of self-constituting enterprise where what you mean by using a piece in the game is set by the tradition of use, by the uh, behavior that you associate with it. In fact, he described language games as being woven into what he called a form of life. That when we talk about things, uh, we are making uh, reference to things, we're asking questions about things, we are um, telling jokes about things, we're doing lots and lots of different things with, with language. And the way that the expressions in the language are used constitutes the meaning of the expressions. To put it very roughly, you might say that the theory of meaning that he came up with for the later philosophy was that meaning is use. The meaning of an expression is the use that it has in an area of language, a language game, which constitutes the rules for the use of that expression. So now you see a number of consequences flowing from this very different view. The idea of a denoting link between language and something other than language has gone. It's no longer the case that something independent of language confers meaning on linguistic uh, expressions. Rather, language is self-constituting. 
language games set the meanings of expressions used in those games. And if you try to use an expression in a language game where it doesn't belong, if you take it out of its context, then you're going to be misusing the expression, you're going to misunderstand it, and thereby you're going to generate a problem. And that is the source, as he saw it, of philosophical dilemmas. He thought that philosophical dilemmas arose from the misapplication of terms, the misuse of them in the wrong contexts. And that if only you understood the normal, straightforward, surface use of an expression in its own appropriate language game, you would never fall prey to that temptation. And this, he thought, solved the problems of philosophy. So once again, you can shut up shop and go home. There, there are a number of other implications of this view about uh, uh, language games as well. He talks about language games as having what he described as a family resemblance to one another. In just the same way as members of a family have something identifiably or recognizably similar in cast of expression or color of eyes or shape of face or way that they behave, so different language games resembled other language games in this family resemblance way. But he, he used the word games for a very particular reason, which is that of all the different games there are, there is no one thing that all games have in common. You try and you will be kept awake by um, the, the task of trying to find one single thing that all games have in common that make them games. The way he put it is that Games have family resemblances to one another, but there is no single criterion, there's no overarching definition that you can give of what a game is because of the great variety of games that there are. And this is how it is with language, that all the different activities that we can engage in linguistically have these family resemblances to one another, but you cannot assimilate uses in one to another. And hence, the putative solution that he gave to uh, all the problems of philosophy. They are just all mistaken misapplications of expressions that don't belong where you think they might. Now it turns out that at the very end of his life, uh, Wittgenstein began to think about a problem which is very central uh, to the theory of knowledge. Uh, the uh, problem of uh, doubt and certainty and claims uh, to know things. In fact, he um, was reflecting on uh, some of the work that G.E. Moore had done uh, half a century before in this area of philosophy. And the notes that Wittgenstein made on this subject were collected by his editors posthumously. He died uh, of, of cancer in 1951. Um, and uh, they were published as a, a book called Uncertainty. And in it he uh, reprised, um, I should uh, opened yet another footnote and point out to you that uh, Wittgenstein was, uh, was no scholar. See, he didn't read very many other philosophers at all. He certainly read Russell, and thereby hangs a tale, which I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, he may have read a bit of Schopenhauer, who was extremely popular in the German-speaking world at the end of the 19th century. He certainly heard uh, at the breakfast table in his Viennese home discussions of Schopenhauer's views. And so little bits of uh, the great Immanuel Kant might have slipped through the Schopenhauerian net into Wittgenstein's consciousness. But he wasn't a reader of the philosophical tradition at all. And so you therefore see in his notes on certainty, him uh, reinventing some of the insights that uh, Hume and, Vic and Kant and others had uh, about the, uh, some considerations relating to what we have to assume, the kind of assumptions we have to treat as undischargeable if we're going to be able to claim to know things or to be certain about anything. But I, I mention this because at the very end of his life, Wittgenstein, having been committed twice over in two dramatically different ways to the idea that uh, philosophy is a load of nonsense, was doing quite serious, quite central philosophy. It's the kind of thing that uh, any of you would do as a first year undergraduate, and uh, there was Wittgenstein taking it very seriously at the end. So that was uh, the, the way that this idea of games entered into Wittgenstein's later philosophy, sustaining that one great continuity of view that um, one can solve the problems of philosophy just by getting it right about language. Here, however, is the game that Wittgenstein was playing in devising these two different uh, philosophies in these two different phases of his working life. <clears throat> 
You remember I said in talking about the Tractatus that Wittgenstein said that the more important half of the Tractatus was the unwritten half. At the very end of the Tractatus, one of the last things that he says, if not indeed the last thing in the Tractatus, is this. What we cannot speak about, we must be silent on. Whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must be silent. And this adverts to the point that he insisted on, both in introducing the Tractatus and at the end, that unless a proposition is a, a, an actual or possible picture of a fact, then the subject matter in question is something that we cannot talk about. And that all the things that are much more important than what common sense and science addresses, namely questions of ethics, questions of our religious beliefs, questions of aesthetic value, these are things we simply cannot talk about. We can only manifest our attitudes to them. He described this by saying that the world of the happy man is completely different from the world of the unhappy man. Meaning? that how you address the world, the stance that you take towards it, your orientation on the world, is in a holistic way uh, expressive of uh, what you think about matters of ethics and aesthetics and religion. And the motivation that lay behind this, the, the second of Wittgenstein's motivations, the first being, of course, to solve the problems of philosophy by understanding language, the second motivation was that matters of ethics and religion are far too important to talk about. And indeed, his motivation there was to try to protect matters of ethics and religious commitment from what he regarded as the, in, the reductive encroachments of the natural and social sciences. That if natural science and psychology could explain why it is that people had certain ethical views or uh, certain religious commitments, then um, the uh, significance of these commitments would be reduced. Um, he may not himself have expressed matters in quite this way, but uh, reductionism, you know, in philosophy and elsewhere, is sometimes described as seeing nothing in the pearl other than the disease of the oyster, taking away all the value and beauty of things by giving scientific or social scientific explanations of them, taking away all the importance <laughs> to individuals of, uh, let us say, religion by explaining religious belief uh, and experience wholly in psychological terms only. And it was this that uh, he, because of the time at which he lived and because of the great advance in scientific knowledge, uh, was anxious to prevent. So the game that he was playing there was to say that all the most important things that we address in our living and our reflection on living the ethical and religious ones, are not ones that uh, can bear um, discussion or examination or inquiry, because such examination and discussion would have to take the form of assertions, of propositions, of descriptions of them, and they would uh, therefore be meaningless, because these things, these very important things, are not the kind of thing about which we can talk. So his second motivation really was to protect something that he saw as important. I mean, it's a very uh, speaking fact about Wittgenstein uh, that um, during the First World War, he read uh, Tolstoy's version of the Gospels. When he actually read the Gospels themselves later on, he was very disappointed because they didn't quite come up to Tolstoy's version <laughs> of them. Uh, but he was very interested in, in religious matters and on several occasions, in fact, on three separate occasions, thought of becoming a monk. He didn't himself talk quite consistently with his view in the Tractatus that this wasn't something you could talk about anyway. He didn't talk very much about his religious views later on in life. Um, but it's evident, I think, from the nature of, of his life that uh, questions of personal morality, uh, his own view, for example, uh, of um, uh, human relationships, a very tormented one. Uh, he was a man who never stayed in the same place very long, never spent more than uh, two or three years in any one location, uh, very often took himself off to live in a solitary way. And evidently there was something um, that was uh, uh, hurtful and difficult in his private life. May very well have been because he was homosexual and at that time homosexuality wasn't uh, widely um, uh, appreciated. Uh, and it's uh, also likely that he felt, if he had religious convictions and feelings, 
about which he was never very explicit for the reasons that the Tractatus itself gives, it may be that he felt guilty about these desires. So um, it would explain a great deal about the unsaid and uh, hidden motivations for his work, that he wanted to make it possible that there should be either a barrier against in the reductive encroachments of natural and social science on these precious matters, or, and here is the rather powerful result of um, the way he put things in the later philosophy, that it might be possible to justify and defend our attitudes in ethics and religion by saying that the discourses of ethics and religion constitute their own meaning because they constitute a game, a language game, woven into a way of living, a form of life, um, having therefore their, validating their own meanings, giving them their own semantic content, making sense because uh, this game has its own constitutive rules. There's nothing to be said about the, um, the, the way that uh, Wittgenstein uses the uh, theory of meaning that he offers us in the later philosophy. It connects to the following fact. Bertrand Russell was a great help to Wittgenstein throughout his life, accepted him as a student before the First World War, uh, helped him to get his uh, doctorate uh, later on in 29, 1930, um, helped him to get a fellowship uh, at uh, Trinity, and then when Moore retired from the uh, chair of philosophy, helping Wittgenstein to be appointed to the chair of philosophy here. And uh, it is a universal truth that if A helps B, B will ever thereafter resent A. And certainly, and certainly, Wittgenstein seemed to bear a great deal of resentment against Russell for all the help that he had got from him, not least because he thought, um, sometimes for, for, for not entirely incorrect reasons, that Russell's philosophy was insufficiently detailed and clear and that he made lots of philosophical mistakes and, and um, he uh, read Russell with the main intention of refuting him. And there were two aspects of, of Russell's views that came to inspire in Wittgenstein two important contributions which have remained a permanent possession of philosophy. Now, the philosophers among you will recognize them under the titles The Rule Following Considerations and The Private Language Argument. And I'll explain very briefly what these are. But they came out of uh, two things that, um, that Wittgenstein had read in Russell. One was this. You may remember that Russell sp spent a, a little while in prison during the First World War in 1918, during the course of which he wrote a, a book called An Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy. It's a jolly good read, actually. And in this book, he um, makes use of the notion of mathematical induction. That is, the application of a rule will always guarantee the same outcome on each occasion. So, for example, the rule add one will always give you the successor to any given number if you apply that rule. And this... Um, prompted in Wittgenstein's uh, later philosophy, uh, in the work that he was doing for it anyway, a thought. And the thought was, how can you be sure that that's the case? How do you know that a rule doesn't start to vary and produce different results uh, way down the line? Supposing you think of the rule plus one, maybe you do get the successor of any given number n until after you've got several billion numbers. Maybe after three and a half billion, it suddenly starts to give you the second successor of a number. How do you know? How can you guarantee that a rule will always uh, have the same outcome? That was one thought. The other thought was this. Again, while Russell was in prison, he finished off a series of lectures which he gave after he was released. Uh, that came to be published under the title, The Lectures on Logical Atomism. And this was Russell's very informal and um, rather in incompletely worked out version of Wittgenstein's Tractatus, because of course they had been discussing these matters together before the war, and they had gone in rather different directions. Very, very austere architectonic of the Tractatus, and this very, very informal, sketchy version of the idea of logical atomism in Russell. But fundamentally, the idea was very much the same, that there are structures, that um, the bottommost layer of structure uh, in uh, the world has to be 
the, the sense data, as uh, uh, Russell called them, that we have when we have empirical experience, and out of which we build the physical objects that we encounter in the world. And physical objects are actually constructions out of actual and possible sense experiences that we have, and they are the atoms. Remember in the Tractatus, the atoms of the world were objects, undefined, and Wittgenstein said, I don't know what they are, but they must be there. But Russell actually gave us a candidate uh, for the, the um, basic atoms of the world, and they are the sense data that we have. This is in line with the empiricist tradition of thinking about how we have our knowledge of the external world. But of course the great difficulty there is that uh, Russell had made an assumption common to all epistemologists since Descartes. Now you were all reading the meditations last night uh, in the bath as well, so you remember Descartes starting from, from the contents of his own consciousness. I know what I am, I'm a thinking thing, and I have ideas and beliefs and so on, so from this internal um, perspective, I have to somehow or other rebuild a degree of certainty about what exists independently of me or outside my mind, and this is the project undertaken in Descartes' meditations. And so the Cartesian starting point is the, the internal contents of one's states of consciousness. And that, of course, is precisely what Russell is doing in the lectures on logical atomism, starting from the, um, the little bits in the computer sense of, of uh, uh, sense, sensing that goes on in the inner space of our consciousness, from which we have to infer an external world or rebuild confidence uh, in these internal states being genuinely representative, representative of something outside ourselves. And this Wittgenstein recognized as posing a major problem. If you were starting as a kind of Robinson Crusoe figure, uh, just all on your own, solo, to talk about the inner states of your own consciousness, how could you do it? How could there be a language which was logically private to yourself in which you could discuss these things so that you could attempt to rebuild your knowledge of the external world? Because isn't it the case that a language has to be public in order for it to exist at all. Here's an example of this. Supposing um, you are uh, uh, washed up on a, on a desert island as a little baby before you've had any chance to be exposed to language, and somehow or other you grow up there safely, and one day a coconut falls on your head, it gives you a headache, and you say to yourself, I'm going to call this headache. And then, alas, six months later, another coconut falls on your head, and once again you've got a headache, and you say to yourself, ah, now what did I call this the first time? Oh yes, headache. Now how would you know that you'd use that sound to denote the experience that you're having on the later occasion? Well, by memory, of course, because on the second occasion you're remembering the baptismal occasion. But here's the problem. Doing that is very like looking at something in The Guardian and thinking, good God, can that be true? And you rush out to buy another copy of The Guardian to see whether <laughs> what the first one says is true. So really, you, you would, as a solo language user, never be in a position to know whether you are using terms with the same uh, content, the same meaning as on an earlier occasion, unless you were a member of a linguistic community which could check and control your uses of expressions, unless you were a member of a rule-following community of speakers who uh, together constitute the meanings of the expressions they use and govern their respective uh, uses of those expressions. So this is um, the uh, uh, important point that Wittgenstein raised about the impossibility that there could be a logically private language. Of course, there could be a contingently private one, like Pepys's diary and so on, but the point about those is that they can be translated into a public language, and so they're not logically private. But if there cannot be a logically private language, then there cannot be a Cartesian starting point for the theory of knowledge. That was the big contribution that Wittgenstein made in reacting to Russell's view. And you can see the connection between the rule-following considerations and the private language argument. They are, in a way, the reverse and obverse of the same point, because the reason why a language cannot be logically private is that language is a rule-governed activity, and rules can only exist in a public setting, can only be followed, can only be recognized as genuinely normative in a public setting. So those are things, two, two points that came out of Wittgenstein's view of language games and the um, self-constituting uh, semantics of, of language on the basis of the language games idea, uh, which gave rise to this um, 
I think, permanent contribution to philosophy in the way of the private language argument and the rule-following considerations. So I suppose we have something to thank resentment for. Well, that, 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 that is my, my um, uh, account of uh, uh, Wittgenstein on games, and that is my account of the game that Wittgenstein was playing, namely to protect those things that he regarded as important, ethics and religion, from the uh, encroachments of uh, a, a reductive scientific uh, attitude to them in his early work and in the later work by saying that ethical talk and religious talk validate themselves because they give themselves their meaning in the language games and forms of life that they constitute. And I think this is uh, of some interest and significance to us today because of course we live at a time uh, are where there is rather a bad-tempered quarrel going on between people who have a religious outlook and people who don't. Uh, and uh, there are arguments uh, about the um, degree to which religious assertions and beliefs have content uh, and uh, whether um, the uh, belief that people have in their actually having content should nevertheless be one that they keep to themselves or whether some real significance attaches to what people say and think when they use religious discourse uh, to the extent even that they might be permitted a, a place in the public square and in public policy matters. So what Wittgenstein had to say touches on the great question of whether religious talk makes sense. And that is where the uh, crux of the debate between the two sides in this bad-tempered argument lie. Uh, does religious discourse make any sense or does it not? Wittgenstein's games offer comfort to those people who think uh, that um, religious talk does make sense. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.